Let's look at the cat ion test. So the positive ion test. So let's say we started with the sample and we added just a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution. Now, there are three possibilities here. The first possibility is there is no precipitate. So when there is no precipitate after a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution, then we can deduce that there is ammonium ion in the sample. So if ammonium ion is present, no precipitate will form. How do we confirm this? By heating up the sample. When we heat up the sample, if there is ammonium ion, what will happen is ammonia gas will be evolved. How do we test for ammonia gas? By using a moist red litmus paper. The observation here will be red litmus paper will turn blue because ammonia gas is alkaline. So this is if there is no precipitate. Now what if after we add a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution, we have white precipitate. So let's go to white precipitate. Now if we have white precipitate, then there are five possible ions that are present in the sample. So remember we're talking about cations here. The five possible cations that are present is MACZEP. Remember MACZEP. There's a reason why I separate it like this. So for MAC is magnesium and calcium ions. Then for ZAP is zinc, aluminium and lead ions. Now, how to differentiate between them? So all five are possible. Now we can break it down into either two or three. This is by adding sodium hydroxide solution until in excess. So when you add sodium hydroxide solution until in excess, then you see whether there is an insoluble precipitate or whether the white precipitate has dissolved. Now, if the white precipitate is still insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide solution, then it is either magnesium or calcium. So now we've narrowed it down to two. If the white precipitate dissolves in excess sodium hydroxide solution, it is soluble in excess sodium hydroxide solution, then it is either zinc, aluminium or lead. So now we've narrowed it down to three. Here we still don't have a definitive answer of which ion is present. So we will have to perform further testing. So the, we will go on to the next test which is using ammonia solution. So when we go to ammonia solution, when you add a few drops of ammonia solution, what you will get is, the white precipitate that we will get is Zmac. So this is different from earlier, slightly different. You will notice calcium is missing. I will get to that later. So calcium is not part of the story. So if you don't get a white precipitate when you add ammonia solution, few drops of ammonia solution, but you do get white precipitate when you add sodium hydroxide solution, then we know that calcium is most definitely present. Once again, if you add a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution and you get a white precipitate, then when you add a few drops of ammonia solution, and you have no precipitate, no white precipitate, then we know that calcium ion is present. So where is calcium ion? Calcium ion joins ammonium ion here. Calcium ion also does not form a white precipitate when we add a few drops of ammonia solution. So this is how to identify calcium ion. Now what about the rest? Now let's look at magnesium. So when we add a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution, we get a white precipitate that is insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide solution. And when we add a few drops of ammonia solution, we still get a white precipitate that is insoluble in excess ammonia solution. So in the case where you add a few drops of sodium hydroxide and you get a white precipitate that's insoluble in excess and you add a few drops of ammonia solution that is still insoluble in excess then we know that is magnesium so now we've differentiated calcium and magnesium now let's look at the others let's look at zap now zinc is a special case as well when you add a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution then 
you get a white precipitate which is soluble in excess then it can be either zinc, aluminium or lead. However, when you add a few drops of ammonia solution, so now it's ammonia solution, you will still get a white precipitate that is soluble in excess. So if both is soluble in excess, white precipitate that is soluble in excess, then we know that it is zinc. Zinc is the only one that is soluble in excess in both sodium hydroxide solution and ammonia solution. So what about aluminium and lead? Let's look at aluminium and lead. Aluminium and lead have the same story for sodium hydroxide solution and they also have the same story for ammonia solution. So here once you add a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution, we have a white precipitate that is soluble in excess for aluminium and lead. They have similar results. But when we add a few drops of ammonia solution, both are insoluble in excess. However, this doesn't help because both show the same results once again when we add ammonia solution in excess. So, how to differentiate between aluminium and lead? It's very simple. We use the confirmatory test for lead. What is the confirmatory test for lead? To a fresh sample. So, we take the sample. This is a fresh sample without ammonia, without sodium hydroxide solution. What we do is we add potassium iodide solution. When you add potassium iodide solution, if lead is present, what will form is a yellow precipitate. The yellow precipitate that is formed here is of course lead to iodide. So if there is a yellow precipitate form, it is definitely lead ion that is present in the sample. However, if nothing is formed when we add potassium iodide solution, then we can conclude that it is aluminium in the state. So now we've differentiated between lead and aluminium. So once again, for lead and aluminium, if you get similar results for sodium hydroxide solution, which means if you get soluble in excess when you add sodium hydroxide solution and when you get insoluble in excess ammonia solution, then you need to test with potassium iodide. If a yellow precipitate is formed, then it is definitely lead to ion that is present in the sample. If there is no precipitate formed, then we know that it is aluminium ion. So now we have distinguished between all the ions, all the five possible choices in white precipitate. Now there is another easier one to identify and that is the colored precipitates. So when we add a few drops of sodium hydroxide solution, there are three colored precipitates that can form. The first is blue precipitate. When we have blue precipitate, there is copper two ions in the sample. There are copper two ions in the sample. And all these colored precipitates are insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide solution. They are insoluble. So if you have a green precipitate, then it means that iron 2 ions are present, Fe2+. If there is a brown precipitate, it means that we have Fe3+, iron 3 ions in solution. Now we also have confirmatory tests for the iron 2 ions and the iron 3 ions. Let's look at iron 2 ion first. For iron 2 ion, the confirmatory test is by using potassium. Here we have to a fresh sample again. To a fresh sample, we add potassium hexacyanoferrate hexacyanoferrate now for iron 2 we add potassium hexacyanoferrate 3 when you add potassium hexacyanoferrate 3 if there are iron 2 ions what will form is a blue precipitate so here we will get 
blue precipitate blue precipitate is formed this is the confirmatory test for iron 2 ions so if a blue precipitate forms then we know that there are iron 2 ions the confirmatory test for iron 3 ions is similar so again to a fresh sample we add potassium hexacyanoferrate as well but this time it is hexacyanoferrate 2 so when we add potassium hexacyanoferrate 2 what we get is blue precipitate we also get a blue precipitate dark blue precipitate both are dark blue precipitate so this is another confirmatory test for iron 3 ion iron 3 ion has yet another confirmatory test and that is to a fresh sample we add potassium thiocyanate thiocyanate so what will result is a red solution red solution so if a red solution is formed once again we can confirm the presence of iron 3 ion so these are the confirmatory tests these exact colored precipitates will also appear when we have ammonia so when you add a few drops of ammonia solution the colored precipitates are exactly the same however they behave slightly differently in excess in excess the iron 2 and iron 3 ions are still insoluble in excess just like when we had excess sodium hydroxide solution however copper 2 ions will dissolve in excess ammonia solution to form a dark blue solution yeah deep blue solution in excess ammonia so that will confirm the presence of cu2 plus ions let's move on to n ion test now n ion test we have four tests we have tests for carbonate, chloride, sulfate and nitrate. So let's go from the easiest to the most complicated. The easiest test is to test for carbonate. There's only two steps involved. So the first is to add acid. Now the acid that we normally add here is hydrochloric acid. So we add 2 cm cube of 2 mole per dm cube hydrochloric acid and what we will see is gas being formed so what we do is we have to test this gas how to test the gas you flow the evolved gas through lime water so if the lime water turns cloudy or milky or chalky this confirms the presence of carbon dioxide gas so if carbon dioxide gas is involved then we have carbonate ion present in the solution because acid reacts with carbonate to form carbon dioxide gas that's all very simple test just add acid pass the gas through lime water now the chloride test and the sulfate test are very similar in their results not very similar they are identical if both are present the result will show the positive result is just white precipitate white precipitate is formed this is the positive result for both the chloride and the sulfate test however the precipitate form is not the same they are different so this is actually both are actually double decomposition reactions so for the chloride test first we add a bit of acid so we add nitric acid in this case now the reason we add acid is to eliminate any trace of carbonate ion that might be present because if we have carbonate ions this will give us a false positive so first we add acid here we add nitric acid and then we add silver nitrate solution eg no3 so when we add silver nitrate solution into a sample containing chloride ions what's going to happen is double decomposition ag plus will equals will react with the chloride ion equals to form silver chloride solid this is our white precipitate so if there are chloride ions 
silver chloride will be formed and the observation is white precipitate is formed. Now sulfate is a very similar story. We add acid first, here we use hydrochloric acid. Again is to remove any trace carbonate ions that might be present in the sample. And then we add 2 cm cube of 2.0 mole per dm cube barium chloride solution. When we add barium chloride solution, again we have a double decomposition reaction here. Barium 2 plus plus sulfate SO4 2 minus equals what is formed here is the insoluble barium sulfate salt. So once again barium sulfate is a white precipitate. So the observation will also be white precipitate. So that's the principle behind the chloride and the sulfate test. Now the nitrate test is a bit complicated. Nitrate has three steps. So the first step is to add sulfuric acid. First we start off with 1.0 moles per dm cube sulfuric acid. And then we add 2 cm cube of 1.0 mole per dm cube of iron 2 sulfate. So we start with sulfuric acid, then we move on to iron 2 sulfate, FeSO4 solution. Now, after we add the iron 2 sulfate, we shake, shake the test tube with the sample. Now, once that's done, now this is a bit tricky. So we have to add concentrated, highly concentrated sulfuric acid, drop by drop, along the walls of the container. We have to tilt it to the side. This is after adding the initial sulfuric acid solution and iron 2 sulfate solution, 2 cm cube of iron 2 sulfate solution. Now, we tilt it to the side and we add, using a dropper, we add sulfuric, concentrated sulfuric acid drop by drop along the walls of the container. And what we expect to see here is, we have to be careful when we do this, what you will see is a brown ring is formed. So the brown ring that is formed will indicate that nitrate is present in the sample. So that is the nitrate test. Some of you have requested for me to do carbon compounds. So I'm only going to do esterification here today. But I also have practice questions on alcohols as well as I have video on hydrocarbons. I will link all of those in the description below. Please do go and check them out after this video. So let's look at esterification. Now, esterification is the reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid to produce an ester. So let's just quickly go through the physical properties of esters here. They have a fruity smell. They are colorless. They are less dense than water. Now let's look at this. Let's name the alcohol first. So let's count the number of carbons. We have one, two carbons and we have the hydroxyl group, which is the functional group of alcohols. So a two carbon alcohol will be, two carbon is eth, ETH is for two carbons, alcohol will be anol. So the alcohol here is ethanol. Now let's look at the carboxylic acid. So we have our functional group. C O O H C double O O H functional group of carboxylic acids. So the number of carbons here is one, two, three carbons. All right. So oh, just not to confuse you with the naming, I've also done IUPAC nomenclature. You can watch my video on that. So here we have three carbons. So three carbons will be prop. Prop is the prefix for three carbons. And for carboxylic acid is anoic acid. So propanoic acid. This is our carboxylic acid and this is our alcohol. Now what will happen is, let's focus on the functional groups because these are what are going to take part in the reaction. So the hydroxide from the carboxylic acid will combine with the hydrogen from the alcohol to form water. And what is going to happen is, this carbon is going to bond with this oxygen. So that's all. That's what is happening. So let's draw that out. So water is evolved of course. Now let's draw our ester. So when we are drawing our ester, so you can just follow. Let's follow the alcohol first. 
let's just copy this part so I'm just going to copy down this part exactly as it is let me take this part out okay so this is the part of the alcohol that is going to be the part of the ester so this is from the alcohol and then the part that is going to come from the carboxylic acid is this so right up to carbon all of this is going to follow so we just take this and add it here so here we have our bond and that's it this is the ester so once again you just remove the OH from the propanoic acid as well as the hydrogen from the alcohol and we have our ester so what is the group here the functional group is C double O O this is the carboxylate group the functional group of ester how do we name the ester so when naming the ester we have to start with the alcohol as the branch so we have to look at the original alcohol so if we okay let's say we started from the ester itself now if you want to identify which is the alcohol and which is from the acid look at where the C double O is this C double O had to have belonged to the carboxylic acid which means this part is the carboxylic acid so we have three carbon carboxylic acid and we have two carbon alcohol now when we are naming the ester we start with the alcohol so the alcohol was ethanol so we start with et so for ester the alcohol we add yl at the back ethyl now let's look at the carboxylic acid portion so the carboxylic acid portion is three carbon so prop prop now for ester we end with no it so the name of this ester is ethyl propanoid the eth comes from the alcohol and the prop comes from the carboxylic which originally formed this ester don't forget to check all the videos i've linked in the description guys and you're probably going to have your exam soon so all the best to you just go there and give it your all see you in the next video